Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Water cremation, which is not new, is gaining national attention. But just what is water cremation? We're well, joining me in a conversation to better understand this growing trend of water cremation is Barbara Kimis, who is Executive Director of the Cremation Association of North America. And so thank you so much for joining the conversation. Thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you know, so uh, literally within a couple of weeks or so, I came across like three articles that had to do with water cremation. And it kind of fascinated me because to be honest, I had never heard of that. But before we get to that, let's try to get a sense of the practice of cremation in America today. Um, in some recent survey I saw, for example, in 2021, the cremation rate in America was 57%. Uh, how do you see the trend and the numbers going? Well, interestingly, the trend of cremation growth has been, has been steady and predictable. Um, the you know recessions, even the pandemic, did not change the kind of percentage growth year over year. Um, so you're right. In 2021, Cana issued a report stating 57.5 percent. Um, but what's really changed in the recent years are the numbers. Of course, the pandemic resulted in um, over a million excess deaths of various causes of death, but over a million uh, over 2020 and 2021. So that's you know a million more people who chose burial or cremation, who planned a funeral for perhaps the first time um, and were confronted with, with making decisions around end of life. In addition to the, the normal two and a half million people who die on average every year. So while cremation rate grows steadily, predictably, uh, we felt it more in the last few years because the numbers increased. And so I think now people are talking about death more openly and, and planning, uh, facing our own mortality and planning or at least asking questions in a way that they haven't before. And I saw one estimate that just by 2025, it'll jump up to 65% or more. And so it is rapidly in terms of cremation being the alternative choice um, in terms of burial decisions. Yes. Yeah, we refer to it as the new tradition in the United States. Um, it varies. Some parts of the United States, like the West Coast or, or Florida, um, cremation has been above 50% for more than 20 years. So they, they, they know cremation. That's what it's what we do. It's been the tra tradition in Washington State or Oregon and, or um, California and Florida for a while. Uh, but Virginia, for example, tracks more with the, the U.S., rate um, just about 50 percent so it feels it feels new for some people they're they are making cremation arrangements for the first time or or going to a funeral where there isn't a body present there's an urn present for the first time so yeah it's becoming a new tradition you know i noticed um that what i find interesting and i do want to get back to the sections of the of the nation in a moment but canada canada in 2021 was at 75 percent i mean i guess they they were certainly much more as a percentage of, of being uh, using cremation than we are. And I, th I thought that was kind of interesting. It is interesting. And I think what Canada, another difference between Canada and the United States is they, um, they're good about linking cremation with memorialization or funeral services. So for example, we have, we have this concept in the United States called direct cremation or direct burial, which is a you know direct meaning um, if there is any kind of gathering or funeral service, it, it may not take place at the funeral home. It may be done privately at home or um, at, a, at a time in the future um, that is convenient for the family to gather. And that concept is uniquely American. So in Canada, you have 75% cremation and pretty much 73% of those cremations have a funeral service, have a viewing, may have a religious service connected to it. Um, and that's not that, that in the United States, we have the whole spectrum from, you know, you can have the religious service before or after a cremation, you can have the body present and then cremation following. You can do all sorts of things. So I guess that's uniquely American, right? We want it our way and highly personalized and yes. <laughs> exactly what we want. Well, that's interesting. Well, let's get back to the, the regions. And, and I may be wrong on this particular assumption, but I'm assuming along the Bible Belt, 
and maybe in the south, there's a little bit more a uh, slower rate of acceptance of cremation. Is that um, uh, reasonable? You're exactly right. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. So this is a hunch or a, an experience that that Cana members, uh, meaning the funeral homes and cemeteries that provide cremation services, have experienced. So a few years ago, we did um, we did some research to determine well, is our hunch right? And we looked at census data and we looked at cremation rates at the state level and um, across the country. And what we discovered is, uh, is that yes, um, areas, a, a state or areas within a state that have a high affiliation or adherence to Christianity, specifically Christianity and not other religions, or um, a lot of manufacturing or uh, agriculture, um, and uh, you know some other demographics that we gleaned from from census data, like high home ownership or lower education. All of these seem to indicate areas where cremation rates are growing slower. And now, be clear: cremation rates are growing across the country. But in some states, like uh, Nevada, is the and Nevada and Washington State vie for this for the state with the highest cremation rate. Both are over eighty percent cremation. Wow, wow. So that's significantly higher, obviously, than the national rate, uh -huh. whereas Mississippi um, is the state with the lowest cremation rate and still under 30 percent cremation. So, you know, it's it's a wide range of um, adoption of cremation. But but in every case, the cremation rate is growing just at different speeds. Well, you know, I have to, to, to kind of confess that I was raised evangelical Southern Baptist and I, I don't know the explicit aspect of it, but certainly um, cremation, you, you, you didn't think about that. That wasn't really an alternative. And now that I'm approaching my uh, golden years, as they say, and getting some age, I, I have to confess I'm kind of struggling and, and wondering and investigating in terms of the alternatives there. And so there is something to that um, as one contemplates that and that religious uh, history and background, it is something there. Yeah, it can be highly personal um, or in, in the case of some religions like Catholicism, uh, the Vatican has made rulings that cremation is is approved. Um, it was not an approved form of disposition mm -hmm. before the 1963, I believe. And but it is now, but no scattering, no dividing remains, place the, the ashes in a uh, Catholic or consecrated cemeteries. So yeah, religions have, have wide, widely varying views about cremation and some, you know, there's no top down ruling of if it's okay. So then it does become personal and what, what makes sense for you and your family. Yeah. I'm assuming that one of the drivers um, of this um, is cost, I guess just in general, cremation is uh, more, uh, less expensive than the traditional ceremony? Generally speaking, yes, because when you think about burial, you you um, often what goes along with burial is, is services, right? So you might have a visitation prior to the burial. You might have a funeral service or a religious service and then a graveside service at the cemetery. So those are common elements. You can do all of them or a few of them. Um, but ultimately, you're not taking that casket home with you. That casket is going in the cemetery, right? <laughs> now, cremation is different because in most states, cremation itself is considered to be legally final disposition, which means I can take that urn home with me. Mm -hmm. I don't need an urn at all. Um, I don't need to have any services whatsoever, or I can do them now or six months from now or years from now. Um, I can divide the remains. I can make jewelry. I, you know, there's, there's a whole host of decisions. So when you talk about cost, what you're really saving immediately, the, the savings in cost has to do with the cemetery expenses because you are not making an immediate decision or immediate purchase of cemetery space. Um, but maybe you're taking it home, but is, is a house permanent placement? No. <laughs> is scattering permanent placement? Yes. And that's, that's perfectly permissible. So um, there's just more decisions to make. And what cremation allows you to do is make those decisions over a period of time. Um, but yes, you're right. Um, for many, many years, until about, um, well, until last year, cost, or sometimes we call it value, is the number one reason 
people said, can, uh, why do you choose cremation? We asked that question as often as we can. And the answer was always, well, cost. This is, this is the best value I can get. It's what I want, but it's also a smart economic decision. Well, starting over the last few years, um, since really since the pandemic started, the answer has changed to be, well, it's what we do. Mm -hmm. Cremation is what we do in our family. It's, it's my preference. It's, um, oh, and it's a smart economic decision as well. But the lead answer is no longer cost. The lead answer is it's our tradition. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's a smart one too. So that's an interesting shift in attitude as cremation, uh, I think, gains in popularity. Mm -hmm. Well, now let's shift our attention now to water cremation. I guess it's alkaline hydrolysis is perhaps one of the technical names. Uh, tell us a little bit about the history of that first before we get into the procedures and process. How did that come about? Sure. So alkaline hydrolysis as a, um, as a kind of means of disposition, that's the technical word, burial is disposition, flame cremation, now water cremation, is, um, has been around since the 1990s for humans. Now, some people might, some of your listeners might uh, think, well, wait a second, that's been used for animals for a long time. And it's true, almost every state Department of Natural Resources uses, has an alkaline hydrolysis um, machine and they use it to dispose of diseased farm animals or even wild animals. Well, that's on mass, that's a very big machine, but the same technology and chemical process was adapted uh, for human use. And so now what alkaline hydrolysis looks like, it started with body donation programs in the 90s and was kind of refined. The first um, states that, that actually offered alkaline hydrolysis were um, Ohio, Florida, and then Minnesota. Um, Florida and Minnesota continue to offer it. Ohio does not. There are 26 states. Actually, if if Virginia uh, passes the law, then Virginia will be the 26th state and um, who, who offer, I'm sorry, who have legalized alkaline hydrolysis. But interestingly, of those 26 states, it's so new as far as offering it for humans. Um, only 15 currently have practitioners, either funeral homes or cemeteries that have the equipment and offer the service. So it's really it's really evolving. And if, if you haven't heard of it, there's a good reason because it's it's really new. It's basically since uh, 2011 that um, these practitioners, funeral homes and cemeteries have been offering it. And 2011 is really not that long ago, even though in 1889, I guess is when there's a process that was kind of used to generate fertilizer. Well, try to describe to us if you can, and then we'll we'll go back and kind of break it down. But, but Tell us a little bit about the process itself and what's involved in water cremation. Sure, and forgive me if I get uh, too technical. I don't mean to be icky, <laughs> but let's acknowledge that death is an uncomfortable subject and it's icky, right, a little bit. So I'm not trying to offend anybody, but uh, basically alkaline hydrolysis is a way to reduce human remains to the skeleton or bone fragments faster than, than burial. Um, so flame cremation is, is similar, right? You do that in a couple of hours using heat, flame, um, and what remains, there's no DNA, there's no biological material, but there are bone fragments, basically calcium phosphate, that uh, you can you know, do what you will with, scatter you know, all the things we've already talked about. So alkaline hydrolysis is similar. Um, when a, when you're a, a person dies, they're they're taken from the place of death to a funeral home. You're still going to work with a funeral director, and then the alkaline hydrolysis facility may be at a funeral home or a cemetery or or the like, and you make the arrangements, handle all the paperwork, arrange any ceremonies that you want to do. The difference then becomes the process itself. So there's a chamber that usually it kind of looks like. Um, uh, the two main manufacturers in the United States, and there's a third manufacturer coming on, is gonna look similar. These, these stainless steel kind of tubes, right? And so there's a basket that comes out, you place the body of the, um, in the basket, close it up. Uh, each process for an adult takes anywhere between 300 and 700 gallons of water. So it's a lot mm -hmm. of water. Mm -hmm. Um, and what happens in the chamber is it's 95% water, 5% 
alkali chemicals, which are usually sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide or a combination of both. Um, sometimes it's powder, sometimes it's liquid format. That really doesn't matter. It's just kind of interesting. And so, um, and then, and then the machine, you close, you know, after the water and the chemicals mix, um, then two different things could happen depending on, on the equipment. One, you could heat the water and raise the pressure within the chamber, which causes the process to go more quickly. So maybe it's four, between four and six hours for the, um, the, the chemical reactions to do their work in the muscle and flesh and everything to um, basically dissolve into the water and the bones remain. Uh, you don't have to use heat or pressure. You could, you could keep the water at room temperature and that takes longer, 10 to 12 hours oh. then for that to happen. Mm. So, and really what's happening in the chamber is um, there's, there's some uh, fans and other things that kind of keep water moving throughout the chamber. You want that to happen. Uh, but otherwise it's just, it's chemistry. It's chemical reactions. The chemicals are reacting with the, the components of the body. And at the end of the process, the, uh, the water and everything, the effluent, which is called, it's not clear water anymore. There are soaps um, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the other things, but you can imagine our, our bodies break down into the component parts and um, it's sterile. There's no DNA present or anything indicating that this was a, a person. It's safe to go into wastewater management. And in fact, little side note, um, alkali, uh, human waste is typically acidic. And so most wastewater treatment requires purchasing alkaline chemicals to add to the treatment process. Um, so the bacteria can do their jobs, right? Cleaning up the water and it can go back into the cycle. So this effluent is actually useful. Um, it, it, it's fine for septic tanks and wastewater management in the right proportions. So I didn't know that, but I learned that in Virginia as a matter of fact. So then you open up the chamber, pull the basket out, and you have essentially the, the full skeleton there, the, the bone fragments, calcium, uh, um, consisting of calcium phosphate. Now, so what's interesting, um, several things. So it takes a specialized machine, um, and it um, could be three to six hours more if you don't use some of the heat or what have you. And that the liquid itself can be introduced into the uh, sewer system or, or the water system or what have you, which is fascinating. One thing I did see that the bone matter compared to flame um, cremation, it's about 33% more. And so I guess when they are pulverized, you actually have more quantity of the deceased, I guess I would say. Uh, but otherwise, the end products are pretty similar. It's, it's really about the process, I'm assuming, that, from what I'm understanding. Very much so, very similar. Um, one thing people don't know, because it's, it's standard practice in the United States to take those bone fragments and process them or pulverize them in a, a purpose-built machine to turn it into the ash-like um, consistency that it's more like sand, right? Grains of sand, if you've ever touched cremated remains. Um, yeah, so that that's a common thing to, to return the the bones, you know, in this um, in this consistency, less than an eighth of an inch um, is usually what the law states. And so then you can fill an urn more easily. You can fill jewelry more easily or scatter. And so the same is done with um, with hydrolyzed remains um, as the technical term. And yes, you're right, it generates more. And also the, um, the hydrolyzed remains are almost always pure white, pure white. Um, uh, the the cremated remains can usually are more of a gray color mm -hmm. and depending on a few things they could have other you know maybe darker like a, a variation in the colors ranging from white to gray and but with hydrolyzed remains they're almost always pure white kind of look like powdered sugar and the end once pulverized have the consistency of that interesting well i'm assuming i'm assuming that when people think of advantages um, I, I heard some of the, or read where some of it's like, it's a, it's a more gentle process, but some make the argument that it, it's, it's, it's really much more environmentally friendly than almost any of the other processes. 
um, and I'm assuming you would agree with, with that. I, we do. I mean, that's language that we use to, to distinguish between the two processes. But it's a little bit subjective, mm. of course, because what one person, you know, 300 gallons of water, is that envirom more environmentally friendly than natural gas used for less than two hours? Uh, you know, I don't know. So um, from a carbon footprint perspective, yes, there are fewer fossil, fossil fuels used with alkaline hydrolysis, even when you're heating the water, even when you factor in creating the chemicals, there's just less fossil fuel used than, um, you know, than say with, with flame cremation for sure. Um, but everybody has their own kind of calculation for carbon footprint or what is environmentally friendly. And I think, you know, so often when we plan for our deaths, we're trying to take into account the values we live now. Mm -hmm. And so if, if that is lowering our carbon footprint, well, then it's it's an obvious choice. If there's other factors in there, I just, uh, one of my board members, for example, when she first learned about alkaline hydrolysis, she said, well, I like spa treatments. I, I enjoy facials, but that kind of, it kind of sounds like a final spa treatment. And I said, well, you won't feel it, but I, I suppose it is. It was just appealing to her. Um, and it, it, you know, I laugh at it because it, 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 but she, she, it really resonated and she connected with that, that process for that reason. Some people have strong connections to water. Some people are afraid of flame or afraid of water for that matter. You know, it's just, it's a highly personal decision and we think choice is good. Why not offer the choices um, and let people have, you know, multiple ways that they can elect to to honor their loved ones or or make that decision for themselves. You know, one of the particular articles I read, and it's amazing some of the statistics that they were given, and uh, by by volume, some uh, Americans 800,000 gallons of formaldehyde with embalmed loved ones each year are buried. Approximately 30 million board feet of hardwood, 2,700 tons of copper and bronze, 104,000 tons of steel, 1.6 million tons of reinforced concrete. I mean, when you see numbers like that, and I'm not sure if, 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 if they're correct, but wow, you see really the cumulative effect of that versus uh, the liquid, I mean, I, I just had no idea the magnitude of some of those numbers. What's your uh, reaction to that? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure um, the source of, of those numbers or, or the, the calculations behind them, but for the sake of this conversation, let's assume they're true. Um, the three and a half million people died in 2021. A similar number will, will have died in 2022. And demographically, our, our death rate will increase over the next 10 or so years. Just That's just a fact, pandemic or no. Um, but so that's a lot of people who died and were either buried, cremated, hydrolyzed, um, other forms of disposition. So if we, you know, yes, there, there are resources involved in this. For, for sure. Uh, one thing I'll note, I, I am um, not, I run the association. I'm an association executive. I'm actually not a funeral director or embalmer. Um, so I learned about embalming that um, that 800,000 gallons of formaldehyde going in the ground isn't quite true because there's a chemical reaction that happens during embalming. Yes, formaldehyde is used in embalming liquids, but that chemical reaction results in preserving the body and, and, um, it's not formaldehyde that's going in the ground. It's, it's, there's a, the formaldehyde is actually broken down. So as far as like, you know, exposure or poisoning earth or that kind of thing with formaldehyde, that just, that just isn't happening. Um, now it's a personal choice. Do, do I want to be, there's reasons why we embalm bodies mm -hmm. because not everybody can come within a day or two right. to see and say goodbye to their loved one. Um, if you, if it, if you can't get there within two days, then yeah, you probably want to embalm, or if you're having a public viewing, if you die in a foreign country and want to bring the body, your body back, you know, your family wants to bring you back. Yeah. You're going to have to be embalmed in order to, to travel like that. So there's really solid, important reasons that embalming is, is still happening. But, um, for most people who choose cremation, um, and alkaline hydrolysis, 
even though both processes, you, you can you can cremate an embalmed body, you can hydrolyze an embalmed body. Oh. Uh, most people don't. They don't choose embalming prior to cremation. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's, again, a preference. It's not a requirement. So I think that I think all those statistics do is show that, OK, our death has an impact on the earth, just like our life does. So um, it's, you know, I, I keep saying it. I'll repeat it one more time. It's a highly personal decision, what you choose and why. Well, we are literally um, less than a minute or so remaining. I want to just highlight one thing, and that is to say in the final moments we have is that there is legislation pending in Virginia. Virginia may become a state that will uh, authorize or uh, legalize uh, water cremation. And then, of course, it's up to funeral homes and what have you to purchase the machines. Well. We learned a great deal, and unfortunately, that is all the time we have. I want to thank my guest, Barbara Kimmis, who is Executive Director of the Cremation Association of North America, for joining us. And of course, I want to thank you for joining us and hope you will do so again for the next Conversations with Bob Denton.